Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius matters? Gifted brains are different. Podcast. An exploration of giftedness. This idea of gifted and what it is and what it isn't. Twice exceptionality. No two twice exceptional people are exactly the same. And neurodiversity. It's okay to be who you are. In childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is Mind Matters. Hey, and welcome to episode 56. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. We're going to be breaking stride in format a little bit to talk about coronavirus. We'll be doing it here on the podcast as well as through our social media accounts, so we invite you to find us and participate. On the surface, being quarantined sounds easy, right? You sit tight, catch up on some housework, binge watch a few TV series, and poof, it's time to go back to work. But the reality of quarantine is quite a bit different, and we're hearing about some challenges you're facing in keeping the family healthy and happy. When everyone is locked inside the same house for an extended period, things can go wrong. Relationships that were stressed can snap. It's just human nature. And while you can't change that, if you understand it better, you can smooth out those rough patches. In fact, we feel like it's even possible to grow, to learn new things about ourselves and about each other, and to do things we otherwise would never have time or the motivation to do. On the show with us today is Chris Crutcher. He's a retired family therapist and the author of over a dozen young adult novels addressing a wide variety of subjects. He has a keen understanding of family dynamics, and we'll be talking not only about surviving COVID-19, but growing from the experience. To join in on the conversation, join us on social media. On Facebook, you can find us at Mind Matters Podcast. On Twitter, we're at Mind Matters Pod. And we'll be using our YouTube page to feature some of the projects we'll be asking listeners to submit. So subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash Mind Matters Podcast. All right, Chris, it's go time. All right. Hello, I'm Chris Crutcher. I'm the author of 15 books. I Probably the most known are Whale Talk and Staying Fat for Sarah Burns. And I'm also a retired child and family therapist, having worked in the world of child abuse and neglect for 20-some years. And I also ran the uh, Spokane uh, Child Protection Team for 30 years. Stay right there. Previously on Mind Matters. Hello, my name is Harry Thompson, and I am the author of The PDA Paradox. What is pathological demand avoidance? They will exhibit differences in communication, social interaction, and also uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. PDA is best understood, according to the literature, as an anxiety-driven need to remain in control. And I tell people, try not to get too hung up on the demand avoidance aspect because then it will make understanding how the child's presentation can differ in school more difficult uh, to grasp. That's episode 54. Look for it wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to be talking about kids, families, and enduring the coronavirus pandemic, its effects, and its aftermath. And, if we're lucky, using it as an opportunity to grow. So, Chris Crutcher, thanks for being here with us. Oh, thanks for having me. So, we invited you to join us not just for your background as a family therapist, but your experiences with family and social trauma. So, how did you get that experience? Tell us your story. I was a sociology and psychology major in in college, um, not a particularly serious student. Uh, mostly I was a swimmer. But my interest was probably more in English, and my interest was probably more in storytelling and that kind of thing. And I graduated, I, I graduated from Eastern Washington back in 1968. And when I, once I got my teaching credential, there were 25 people applying for any teaching job that I applied for, and at least 24 of them were far more qualified than I was. But it was a time, particularly down in California, where there were a number of uh, alternative schools popping up. And alternative schools in those days were more like alternative to school. Right. 
And I I went down to the Bay Area for most of that, and I was there for almost all of the 70s. And I taught and then was director in a K through 12 dropout school for kids that couldn't make it in the public schools. So at, at that same time, I wanted to be a writer. I hadn't written anything yet, but I realized I was in, I was in a hotbed of story. I mean, every kid in the school had been kicked out of school, so every kid had a story. They, they weren't very well. An alternative school like that wasn't well-funded. And so you really, the teachers and anybody there, you know, went by their guile. I mean, we went by creativity. Mm. And one of the things that we learned right off the, right off the top was all of the good things that we learned in teacher school had been tried. These kids did, weren't making it in that um, environment. So one of the things that I recognized right off was that we really had to go to the experts to teach these kids, and the experts were the kids themselves. And I mean, I remember years, particularly after I was director, where I'd sit down with a kid and just say, you know, if, if, I, if I fail, you fail, and if you fail, I fail, we got to figure out a way to keep you in here. And these kids would tell you. So, so I, did, I did that for, like I said, for, for about 10 years. And so I was, I was connected with kids from four and a half years old to 19. And like I said, I was wanting to write in those times, and I, and I probably, to some degree, unconsciously picking up characters. But I was picking up survival skills, and I was picking up stories that I would have never run into in a, you know, the logging town in Idaho that I grew up in that was 943 people. So then when I came back up to the Northwest, I didn't know what I wanted to do, they were, they were just starting a program at the Mental Health Center here in Spokane that was a real comprehensive wraparound program for child abuse and neglect families. And it was the early 80s at that point. And they had started figuring out that when kids were being abused, when there was sexual abuse in the home or there was physical abuse or neglect to the point of danger, that if we were going to be removing kids, we needed to get them back as quickly as we could if it was possible to get them back. So we had this huge wraparound program. We, we, were, seeing, we were seeing clients uh, four times a week, and then we would, in groups, we'd split them up. The kids would have groups of their own, sometimes men's groups, sometimes couples groups, sometimes all family groups. So we, we were getting a look at these families from every possible perspective, really seeing the power of the connection of family, and that if there was a way to get it together, you had to get it together. And one of the things that I learned in that time, I mean, you take this job and you're, you're, you're behind already. I mean, you're an expert. If, if they call you into court two days after you get that job, you go into the court as an expert. And you better, you better be up to speed because lives are in your hands. Mm -hmm. You know, some kid may or may not get his or her parents back because of, of how you see things. And the first thing that I had to learn was I needed to get myself out of the way. You, you know, anytime when you're young and you want to help, there's this tendency, or at least there was for me, to think that I knew how to help instead of shutting up and listening to them to how I could help. And I started learning to look at the world through the eyes of my clients. And for the most part, I, my expertise was considered to be adolescents and parents. But I worked with a magical play therapist who worked with the little kids. And you would watch this woman work through the, through the one-way glass. Her name was Carolyn, and, and she'd just disappear. And you could see the world through these kids' eyes. And you could see at that really kind of raw level the power of, of family connection and the draw and the fear and these incredible... Uh, survival skills that five-year-old kids would come up with. And the more I would look at that, I mean, I would watch that and I would think if that's true for little kids, it's also true for adults. I mean, it's a continuum. Teenagers are just big kids and adults are just big teenagers. And there's a development schedule and all of that. So when, the more I would watch these little kids work, the more I would realize that working with the, with the teenagers and working with the parents whether you agreed or not, you had to see it through their eyes first. And it was not your job to tell people what to do or how to be or I have this great idea for you. It was your job to listen and see if you could find some way to walk with them long enough. 
for them to be able to find some relief and some way to feel like they had some power in what happened next. Mm -hmm. And at the same time I was doing that, I was, I had just started writing. I, I wrote my first book as I was, as I was finishing up at the dropout school down in, down in Oakland. And I was changing my idea of what a hero is because th there were little kids and there were adults who had, you know, little kids who were standing up under what would have crushed me and adults who were, who had done such shameful things to kids, but were still willing to admit that and try to do something different and better. Now, a lot of them didn't. I mean, a lot of them didn't want to have anything to do with it, but it just, it gave me, a, I thought at the time, and I still think, um, a real, a broader view of what the human condition is. I like how you stated that kids come with a set of survival skills. And I, th I believe that that's really true. What do you think, you know, just kind of bringing that into our current reality with the coronavirus and you're up in Washington, which is kind of, you know, the epicenter of a lot of things that are going on. How do you think those survival skills help kids through an event in a time like this? I think if we learn to if we learn to do at least some of what that play therapist did and actually still does, it would really help us because for most of us, our kids come home and and you know this coronavirus, if they're little kids, I mean it can be any kind of a monster. And if you're, if you're talking about teenagers, you're talking about them losing out on, you know, losing out on their last years of school or their sporting events. I mean, there's a whole lot of loss that can go with this. And what I would, what I would really want to tell adults to do is to, is to sit back and really see if you can see it through their eyes, put yourself back in that place. And, you know, for the most part, it doesn't, it doesn't do us a lot of good in, times like this just to say everything's going to be okay. I think it's important to say, I will do whatever I have to do to make sure that we all get through this and that you get through this and that you get as much as, as you can get. But we're all, it's one of those things where we, we're all working together and I need to know how you're feeling. I need to know how you see this. I need you to be able to tell me the truth about, about yourself and I'll tell you the truth about myself. Because when, you know, you get, you get a lot of, and this was back, well, this is from anywhere. You, you get a lot of parents and, you know, particularly guys, they want their kids to be tough. They want particularly their boys. They want their boys to be tough. But this may not necessarily be a time to be tough. Maybe it's a time to be pensive. Maybe it's a time to really take a look at what influence I have and what influence I don't. And then I'm going to be what I'm going to be doing with kids, if, if I'm a, a parent, is I'm going to be trying to spend some time with them, but I'm also going to be letting them be by themselves when they want to be. I'm going to do everything I have to do to keep that virus away from us. But it, this might even be a magical time for some families to really get to know each other again. You know, for me at home, there is that pressure to like, be managing everything, and it's a lot as a parent, yeah, trying to take on everything from all fronts. And I think a lot of parents feel that pressure. They're afraid to show that vulnerability, but we're all feeling really vulnerable right now. And that's really important, I think, because like you say, there's a, there's a tendency for a lot of us to want to make sure that we kids don't see us be unvulnerable. But there is such value to a kid to see that other people are vulnerable too, that adults are vulnerable too. Like kids need to know, and we do, we talk about this all the time as therapists, and you know this, you know, we need, we want kids to know that we feel vulnerable sometimes, we feel sad sometimes. Because one of the things that does is validate their feelings. One of the things that I, that should have been obvious to me, but one of the things that really moved me when I watched some of the play therapy things with the Carol's work did, uh, or that she did, you know, when a kid is angry, she's angry right with him. When the kid is sad and broken, she's sad and broken right with him. So there's that just that kind of reflecting piece. It lets a kid know that the things I'm going through are okay. And this particular thing, I mean, this is on the news all the time. 
this is on everybody's mind all the time. You can't go anywhere with your kids or you can't turn on TV unless you get on Netflix someplace. You can't hear anything that doesn't include this. And it ha- that has to make kids uneasy because, you know, newscasters are uneasy. Every, everybody that talks about it is uneasy. And what they say over and over again is, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But it's also not the worst thing in the world to not know what's going to happen. Yeah. Because when it does, then, we, you know, we can make a plan. Well, you know, I just feel like kids thrive on routine. Yes. I thrive on routine. I think adults, yeah. It's like knowing what to expect. Sure. And we're all kind of in this place. And I feel like that's a big part of probably the work that you did when you were working with those kids who had that extensive trauma. A big part of trauma is not knowing what to expect, that feeling of safety. Exactly. It's just like the rug is pulled out from underneath you. For kids who have been traumatized like that, one of the things, I mean, and particularly when you're working with people with, with certain kinds of personality disorders, one day your action is lauded and the next day it's punished. And you don't know, you're always vigilant because you never know what kind of a response you're going to get. And that, and that kind of uncertainty, I mean, look at, look at, you know, look at how those kids turn out if they don't get help, if they don't get some way to, you know, to, to put that someplace and realize that, that that was kind of a crazy thing that went on in their lives and it doesn't have to keep going on mm-hmm. once, once you can get them, you know, once you can get them away from it. Right. What ideas do you have, you know, you, when you used to work with parents or even just from any of your experiences, what's a way that parents can help to find that balance, whether they're, you know, trying to work from home and homeschooling and child care? Like, is there anything specifically that you think would be useful for them to keep in mind? Well, number one, particularly on the front end of this, when it's even less predictable, I'm going to go the way the river's flowing here if I'm, if I'm the parent. Number one, I'm not going to worry too much about homeschooling. I mean, we'll do it we can get a routine going and we can try to make sure that we, you know, do some, do some schoolwork every day. But I'm going to be way more, I'm going to be way more interested in the kind of connection that we're making here, the, the kind of the nest that we're building for this time. Yeah. And the educational piece is always important, but the educational piece can come at its, at its own pace. I'm, I'm going to go for security I'm, and I'm going to go for fun. If I'm a family that knows how to play games, if I'm a family that knows how to, how to laugh, I'm going to get as much humor going as I can. And, uh, I mean, there's, it's hard to feel really bad when you're laughing, Yeah. at least in that moment. So games that, um, that encourage that and, and, you know, things on TV or shows that they're watching on iPads and things, but doing as many of those things together and stopping and talking about them and making sure that the kids opinion about anything that we're talking about is is valued as much as mine or as anybody else's in the family like one of the things one of the most important things that I've ever thought that I could do as a therapist whether I was working with adults or teenagers or little kids was to help them find a way to feel like they had an influence over what happens next yeah. And that empowerment thing is, it, it, I think it can't be overstated. Mm-hmm. Giving them some control over their little corner of the world, even when everything else is rather chaotic. Right. And that's where a lot of those survival skills that I was talking about come from. You know, if, if we provide a healthy way for a kid to feel that empowerment and that they, their action makes something happen. That's great. If we don't do that, they'll find a way to do it themselves. Mm-hmm. And some, that may or may not be healthy. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, parents doing what they can with their kids and balancing all of that and establishing some family cohesiveness. What about some of those natural family disputes that are going to come up? I know with my kids... Who has rights over which video game at what time has been <laughs> interesting to navigate <laughs> um, or personal space? You know, it's just it's just a lot of time together <laughs> and that we're not quite used to. 
It is, and our siblings are not necessarily our best friends. Right. <laughs> I mean, I look back, I think if this had been going on when I was a kid, I'm, I'm a middle kid, and my brother was a little under three years older than, than I am. And, and, and uh, he, man, he could talk me into anything. <laughs> so I needed, I needed somebody to come in with some structure. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to set down some rules for fairness. You know, the video game thing is going to be, you know, it's going to be a time thing or whatever, but I'm going to try to let them participate in that. And like, I remember <laughs> when there would be like one piece of cake left and my brother and I were, could have it, but we had to split it. And my dad would say, okay, one of you cut it and the other one gets to choose. Man, you never, we were like, we were like architects <laughs> cutting that piece of cake. <laughs> that, that's as close as you get to 50 50. Because <laughs> the guy cutting it knew the other guy was going to get to pick it. Right. And those kind of things where, you know, as much as the kids can participate in them. And, you know, it's that, it's that old thing about saying there are, there are kid problems and then there are problems where adults have to step in. And sometimes, you know, the adult has to just step in with the ground rules. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th there also has to be people have kind of misused the concept of timeout from the first time that I ever heard about it. Timeout was it's a sports thing. You know, I mean, it's a sports concept. You stop things and regroup. It isn't a punishment where somebody goes away and doesn't get to come back until I say they can come back or, you know, whatever it is. It's time away from. Yeah. And I would reestablish that. So uh, kids can say time out from each other. Or they can say, they can call time out from us because it, what, it, what it basically is, back off, get yourself together and figure out a way to solve a problem. Yeah. And there's real power in that. I think there's, there's a way for, you know, when I look back at it, some of, the, some of the things that my mom and dad did gave me a say in what happened next. Because like I said, my, if left to his own devices, my brother could... I mean, he talked me into peeing down the heater. <laughs> we had to move out for three days. Oh, man, this is really neat. This is wait till you to see what happens. You know, what happened was <laughs> I was almost thrown out of the family. <laughs> it was a heater grate right in the middle of the living room floor, boy. Uh, <laughs> yellow smoke rolled up out of there. <laughs> that was lore in my town for about for years. I imagine. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> Oh, it reminds me of my daughter, Maggie. She's our middle child, and she would do anything for our older son's approval, and he just really sticks it to her sometimes. Oh, yeah. They never give up. I have a, I wrote a, what I call an ill-advised autobiography called King of the Mild Frontier a few years ago, and I, there are a whole bunch of stories in there about just that. My brother would say, want to do something neat? <laughs> it never, not one time was it ever neat. But you never stepped away. But yeah. I tried it every time I thought, this might be the time. <laughs> you trusted and him. It never was. Oh. Because he could sell it. That's funny. And it's, and it's interesting to think about where we are now and, you know, just reflecting on those memories of our own childhood. Yes. I'm so curious about what everything that's happening right now will mean to our kids as they enter adulthood. Boy, I do too. And, and again, you talk about hard to predict. Yeah. But you know, I look, back, I look back at the years when I was working in the alternative school. And a lot of those kids, I mean, they were, they were street kids from Oakland. And they were, there were, some, there were some, uh, some really interesting stories. And particularly with, the, with some of the older kids. But one of the things... One of the things that always worked, or, or most of the time worked, was if you would take a powerful kid, particularly somebody from the high school, and send them down into the junior high or send them down into the, into the, into the elementary school to help some kid who was struggling, their personality would change mm -hmm. when they were going to do that. And that whole idea, that whole idea of, of, getting kids to get that, the good feeling that, it, that you get from actually being successful, helping somebody out. Mm -hmm. As much as that can be done, the power of kindness, really, I mean, it's a little bit cliche, but the power of, of, 
of seeing your influence from kindness is is huge. And it's a way to, to some degree, and it depends on the family, of course, but to some degree, it's a way to, in this time when, the, when we're spending all that time together, is to forge a different way for siblings to look at each other. Yeah. Well, whenever we get out on the other side, we'll definitely be changed. I think you're right. I noticed that social media has been an interesting factor, both for adults and definitely for our older kids and teens. You know, we see videos of people who are, you know, singing on balconies over in Italy, or there's a lot of people who are presenting different creative abilities. I don't know. I have this idea, and I I don't know what, what your thoughts are about maybe there's something about getting through this adversity that might bring us back together socially, both on the small scale and on the larger scale. You know, I I look at this and for quite a while now, I've been thinking exactly that same thing, because one of the things about a a virus like this, it's, it's, it's not political. It lets people who have always been able to protect themselves not be able to protect themselves any better than anybody else. There's a sense of we're all in this together. And you, I mean, you can talk yourself out of that if you want to, but the fact is we're all in this together. And I think that does, I think that does have the, the possibility to, to change how we see each other because it really is a divided country and it really is, um, it, it's become almost a given that we're so opposed to each other philosophically. And this virus has no philosophy. Everybody's at risk. Um, the opportunity to, to reach out and help. Like I've got a woman, <laughs> I'm supposed to be an old guy, but I got a woman living next to me that's probably in her late eighties and I can get out and get around. You know, if she needs something, I can get it for her. And I know how to do that. And I know how to keep myself safe and I don't want her going out. You know, I've lived in this house for, I've lived in this house for 35 years and I probably before this had, I don't know, six or seven encounters. They were friendly encounters, but we didn't really know each other very well. So I think there's, there's, there is that. There's, a, there's just, a, there's this, uh, uh, everybody, when you're, even with the social distance and all that, or the, or the, the six feet distance thing, there's a look at each other when you're giving the other person room that's kinder than the look that we've been giving each other in supermarkets for, you know, for the last hundred years. So there are opportunities here, I think, for us to understand that we really are way more alike than we are different. You know, I know in the books that you've written, we were chatting before that we began recording about that a lot of your books have been banned in different, in in varying ways. Mm -hmm. But I think that young adult literature is really good at helping us see the world through other people's eyes, like you were mentioning, even just with the play therapy. Right. And that literature really can be that connection to the world that maybe we hadn't thought about in, in that way before. You know, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I stayed with that, I, I, I said I wrote, a, I wrote a book in the 90s that was an adult book, and I, I was offered a really lucrative contract to make this character a, a you know, a repeat character. And it was, it was kind of a suspense book, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get back to, I wanted to get back to writing about teenagers because that time in your life is, it's such a platform. I mean, all of a sudden you, I mean, your, your brain isn't completely developed. Your frontal lobe isn't completely developed, but it's getting there. And the hormones are going crazy, all those. But there are decisions that you make when you're a teenager that are the, they're absolutely are the foundation of what happens in your life. The, you know, what you decide you want to do for a living, the people you decide to surround yourself with, who you think your friends are, romance, all those kinds of things. And to see that in that innocent way, you know, that, that brash, risk-taking, yet naive way, is really powerful because that's something that we never completely get over as adults. And it's, I think it's important to, to remember back to when all this started for us in terms of, you know, using our rational brain more than we did when we were elementary school kids or, or even, even lower junior high. 
you know, I, I used to talk with, I had a lot of men in, in my uh, in my groups and in men that I worked with over the years as a therapist. And they get into this place and you know, they like to call their midlife crisis or whatever it was. And they say, go, I'm acting just like I was when I was a teenager. And you're going, yeah, that's because you didn't fix the stuff you were doing when you were a teenager. Right. And you can take them back to that time and the decisions they made. And all of a sudden they can, they can see what was mature and what wasn't mature. And, you know, a good reason to make a different decision than they're, than they're making while they're, you know, leaving their family and going out and buying a motorcycle or whatever it is. <laughs> whatever, whatever it is that. Uh, <laughs> whatever it is. Know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Starting a podcast. No, I, mean, I was going to say, that's a whole other, <laughs> yeah, switch over to another channel here. So I'm curious, which of your books do you feel like now that everyone has lots of time, mm -hmm. do you think you would recommend for our audience that they might really enjoy right now? Most of the adults would really enjoy uh, King of the Mild Frontier, which is it's nonfiction, but it's a it's a autobiography. Actually, it, everybody that's in it says it is fiction. But <laughs> I wrote it so I get to say, but it is a lot of that kind of looking back. Um, I think the books that resonate. There's a book called Staying Fat for Sarah Burns, and it's about a girl who's been in a horrible moment in her life has been disfigured by, by having been, had her face pushed against a hot wood stove. And she's, she was a cute little baby and, and then all of a sudden everything went south. And the levels of friendship that get explored in that story, I think are, are really germane right now. Um, there are two others that I think would work real well for one. One is called Whale Talk and it's it's probably the most comprehensive of relationship books. Is a lot of a lot of um, racial struggle and a lot of a lot a lot of uh, friendship stuff and so much parent child. Uh, another one that people keep coming back to who've been involved in any kind of grief, and it's probably the, it's the latest of these three. It's a book called Deadline, and it's a story about a young. He's 18 years old. He's getting ready to graduate from high school when he gets the news that he has a terminal illness. And he basically <clears throat> has one year to make his footprint. And when I wrote it, I was writing, I was, I was looking for a reason for my main character to really care. <laughs> and I had worked with a kid who had, who had been diagnosed with a pretty aggressive leukemia. So I had a lot of information about the reason that so many things were important to him. Mm. Why his friendships and his relationship with his parents and you know, all of those things that we consider to be fundamental to being alive. So here is this kid, he's 18 years old. One day he thinks he's going to, you know, he's getting ready to go out and conquer the world. The next day, I've got about a year to make my, to make my footprint. Yeah. Number one, he's, it scares him. But when, once he gets that part under control, then he has to figure out, you know, how do I want, how do I want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered and how do I want to experience this? Yeah. Those are probably the, the ones that I would recommend. Chris, thank you so much for your time talking to us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. This was fun. I think the one thing people need to hear right now is that it is okay to not be okay. We're all struggling, and this isn't easy. Some of us are trying to figure out how to work from home. Some of us are wondering how we'll pay our bills. Some of us are struggling being away from family or friends. And on top of all of this, we're managing our kids, many of whom are intense and struggling in their own way. We will get through it together. One of the things that helps me is connecting with and helping other people. And I'd really love to connect with you and hear your story. You can find me in our Facebook group, the Mind Matters Gifted Ed and Advocacy Group. We're trying to find some ways to lift everyone's spirit, so I'm hoping that you'll join the conversation. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on Mind Matters.
Have you ever woken to a sweet morning rain? Had your cup of coffee while it pattered on your window pane? Have you ever seen the sun go away down in the horizon? Singing like a red supernova into the blue ocean. Thank you to Chris Crutcher. You can grab his books on Amazon for some quarantine reading. We'll have links to those and to his website on our episode page at mindmatterspodcast.com. Thanks also to our social media followers as well. They're keeping us company while we're all locked down inside with our kids. It's nice to see what the rest of the world is doing. Also, thanks to our helpers on patreon.com. Those folks who help us pay the costs of doing the podcast to join them and contribute a little, please go to patreon.com slash mindmatters. For Emily, I'm Dave Morris, the executive producer of Mind Matters. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.